now. So hello everyone. Welcome to this episode of Women for Humanity. I'm Lisbeth Monetong, I'm the founder. Today my guest is Linda Cole, founder and executive director of African Women Rising. And Linda is joining me from Santa Barbara in California. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Yeah. African Women Rising is a small nonprofit with a big impact and was launched in 2006 in Santa Barbara and Uganda to empower women after war by providing technical skills and support for success via education, agriculture, and microfinance training. African Women Rising works in partnership with community-based groups to improve the lives of women in post-conflict post areas of Africa. Rooted in the conviction that women should be uh, active stakeholders in defining their own development strategies, African Women Rising builds on initiatives that the women themselves have started. And I must say, it's so impressive what you're doing. So hello, Linda, and a huge welcome uh, to you. And thank you so much for taking the time to share your story. Very impressive story. And I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to welcome you into the outstanding women of, um, of Women for Humanity. So we will be talking a little bit about you and, and your organization, of course, um, in Uganda. Before we start to talk about the UK, you, the organization, just let's talk talk a little bit about you. Uh, if you should describe yourself with three words, what would those be? <laughs> um, compassionate, hardworking, and uh, what would be a third? Um, Caring, maybe? Yeah, yeah, that would be a good one. It's, it's, a, it's I, always, I always have a hard time with, with those. <laughs> yeah, I know. We all, but sometimes it's a good exercise, actually, because it is. Uh, yeah. It tells yourself what, what you actually stand for when you just have to, to get it out like that. So um, uh, please tell us a little bit about you as a young girl. Where did you grow up? And, and did you already at that time have uh, ideas of uh, making a, a, such a positive impact in the world as you do? Um, I, so I grew up in northern Sweden mm -hmm. and in a very, very small community. Um, and uh, I had absolutely no thoughts of living in the U.S. or working in Africa. Um, that came much, much later. I, I was very passionate about theater and um, was participating in different theater groups. And um, one of my mentors, um, after I finished high school, he suggested if I wanted to continue with acting that I better go and get some life skills and life experience. And so I saw an ad in the paper about volunteering in Africa. And I figured, okay, there's some <laughs> life experience right there. And so I went on a one-year program and then ended up staying for, you know, the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, and so, so what, what is your education? And because then you were in Africa. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. what, what, is your Afri uh, what is your education and what brought you to, to start uh, African Women Rising? So I, uh, so I started working as a volunteer in um, development aid and eventually got hired to work as a director for um, a development pro program. And I, so I worked for a few years in Angola, Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau. And when I was in Mozambique, that's where I, I met Tom who's from Santa Barbara and he convinced me to to go to California with him so I did and so now you know I'm a little bit behind in my education and so I started studying here and so I got um, a bachelor's degree in um, global studies with a minor in women culture and development and then later on I continued my studies and got a master's in humanitarian studies at Tufts University um, so, so that's my, my educational background. And, um, and so I did, you know, 
for a long time, I did work for different organizations. And um, Tom and I at one point moved to Uganda and I started doing work for short-term consultancies when I was there. He worked for Save the Children. And we, for many years, have been talking about starting an organization and and I felt I was a point where I could either continue to do these short-term consultancies I can get a you know a real job (laughs) or I could actually start the organization and and the reason why I I wanted to do this was because I I'd seen so many issues with the work that was being done in development world where it was often donor driven, it was short term, um, it, it, organizations would come in, they work in an area for a few years and then you know, it's over, but you don't really see any change. Yeah. And that was very frustrating for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was also seeing that many of the people that need support the most, they're not getting it. So, so that was my impetus for starting an organization. Okay. And uh, Uganda, it was because you lived in Uganda? That you started yes, there? there was a couple, couple of reasons. So my background is working with women in conflict and post-conflict areas. And so when I was thinking about an organization, I wanted to do something uh, with women in those areas. Um, at this point, I had two kids, and it's difficult to live with children in conflict or post-conflict areas. Um, so Uganda was actually a great option for us because there was, at that point, this was in 2006, there was still a conflict going on in northern Uganda. But if you were living in the south, you wouldn't have, you know, things were just like normal. So, so we lived as a family in Kampala, and then I would spend time up in the north. And how far um, is the so distance? The first, uh, well, right now they've improved the road. So it takes about <laughs> five hours to get there. Uh, when I started working there, sometimes it would take me eight, nine hours to drive up. Um, did did so. you go by yourself or you had you had security guards with you? Or I wouldn't guess it called body uh, in, in the beginning, I would, uh, so I would often have someone with me in the car and then I would, um, I would always check in um, over the phone so that people knew where I was. Yeah. 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 Um, but um, yeah, so the first, the first year that I was up in northern Uganda, I would, uh, um, like, I, I would just travel around and talk with as many people as I could and listen, you know, more than anything was just to listen and, and to get an understanding of what was going on. And if I start this new organization, what is really needed? Yeah. And like, I had all these great ideas of what I wanted to do, but I realized that that was the absolute wrong way to yeah. start it, that it was not about my ideas, but mm-hmm. actually about what people on the ground were doing and, and, uh, recognizing is important yeah and you what did you start out with so you, you because now you have five different um pillars mm-hmm. pillars you, you, you i am so sorry <laughs> that's, okay. that's fine okay i need to figure out how to uh turn this off uh okay yeah, there so. we go <laughs> i should have checked that in the beginning no, <laughs> <laughs> no problem uh yeah. Yeah. What so, the- so the way I started was um, I got a list of all of the organizations, like local organizations that that were um, in northern Uganda, and I started calling or contacting or visiting as many as I could to get a sense of what was going on. Yeah. And many of these organizations, they were not actually functioning at, at all. They were just organizations on paper. And um, and so I realized that was not necessarily the right way to go. And many of them were working kind of in the, um, more in the urban areas. Um, and um, so I went out into the camps. There were, at this point, everyone in Northern Uganda were living in camps for internally displaced people. Um, and so I went into the camps and started talking with 
with women and mm -hmm. camp leaders there. And and one of the the main thing people were saying was like, look, we don't have access to capital. If you don't have money, you can't do anything. And uh, so that's that's what we need the most help with. So so that's where we started. And then it slowly built where we went from, we have um, a village savings and loan association. It's kind of a type of microfinance program yeah. um, where we help women build banking systems within their communities. Um, so that was the first part. Um, and this has grown into helping women become entrepreneurs, teaching business skills and um, and then the majority of people that we work with are farmers. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at how can we pr improve agricultural productivity using local resources and using a regenerative type of agriculture where um, uh, we focus on soil quality and water conservation and all good organic sustainable stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the microfinance, that was the first thing you started with. And I actually read you, you now, you have, is it 15,000 women has had, until now has, has access to, to that via? Yes, um, that's, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's quite yeah. impressive. That's really fantastic. So how, how does you, tell us a little bit how it works. So you, you bring capital that you, that you raise from, from sponsors? Yes, so I have, in Uganda, we have um, a staff of 150 people yeah. that run our programs. So I'm the only non-Ugandan. I'm also the only staff here in the US. And um, so my main role now is basically fundraising to make sure that things keep going. Um, and I do that through private donors, foundations, events. And we also look for partnerships in Uganda, working with, with bigger organizations there. Um, and um, I come and visit with staff once every quarter. Obviously this last year I didn't yeah. <laughs> travel because of the pandemic, but uh, um, that's how we have set it up. And, okay. and my goal is you know, eventually that it will be 100% Ugandan led. Yeah, so you you build you give them the capital and then they can loan they can make a loan in the uh, I read some so so actually it's groups of women. Is it, is yes. It, yeah. So so with the with the the VSLA the Village Savings and Loans Association it's they are based on um, what the women call revolving funds. Very often in poor communities you will see you'll find groups of women saving money together. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the month, one person in the group will get, you know, a chunk of money that they yeah. all save. So this is this is a great system to enable people to get just you know a little extra cash. But if if there are twenty people in your group, that means that it will take twenty months yeah. until you get access to this, yeah. right? So so what we the VSLAs are building on that idea that women can save money together and have access. So uh, what we're doing is combining the savings with microfinancing. So we provide um, a group of women with a small grant of $250. So now they have a little starting capital. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to wait 20 months, all the women in the group can have access to capital. And at the same time as they can borrow this money, they also save on a weekly basis. So the little pot of money they have that keep, keeps growing. So that means more women can borrow money. Um, and then they pay back the loans um, normally with uh, a 10% interest. Mm -hmm. The interest rate is decided by the women themselves. Yeah. Um, and so this is, this is a great way for women to it's, it's essentially building a little banking system in their communities and, and so that they always have access to capital. Yeah, it's great. And then do the women themselves decide how much they can loan? 
because some some women would like to learn more than others i imagine that depends what they want to to spend yes so it it varies a little bit depending on the groups i mean they they make their own bylaws but generally you cannot borrow more than what your saving capacity is yeah okay yeah, yeah. and then sometimes they will make uh, uh if there's someone who has a you know a superb business idea that they want to do maybe they'll make an exception but uh generally uh women can borrow what they what they're saving yeah i, I read some of the stories for some from some of the women who, who borrowed it's uh, it's amazing how such a small in our eyes of course yes. amount can and can make such a, a difference from um for, for, for those women and, and I also because that was also something you think about you have all this money what do you do with them because uh, how do you keep them safe uh, so I also read that uh, you they have a trunk and they have a box of, of where they put in the money and then three keys and three women has to be they have to be three to open these uh, to open the keys right is that how That's it works right. yeah yes and, so so yeah so that there's so the idea is that we should, there should never be a lot of money in no. the box, right? That the money should always be out yeah. with the women. Yeah. Um, but, but, but of course, you know, at times there's, there's a lot of money in there, especially at the end of the year when everyone brings, you know, pay back their loans. Mm -hmm. And so once a year they will open the box and people get all the money that they saved over the year back so so at that time you know there can be several thousand dollars in this yeah. box yeah. and um so that yeah so there's three people to open the box and they rotate where the box is kept so that no one yeah. can come and steal yeah. it and it's yeah yeah it's a lot of money i i actually read that um they have been able to save up to three million more than three million dollars is yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. Quite a lot. Of no, I mean, that is, it's amazing. This is where, I mean, the, the most women save between 25 cents and sometimes up to a dollar a week. Yeah. So then to reach $3 million, it's, yeah. Quite a lot of money. Impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. you, and then you help them to, to open bank accounts also. Is that for the group you will help them to, to open a bank account or is it for the women in, uh, special women? Some, some want. Yes. To... So, so when, you know, once the groups get established and they start, um, they start dealing with bigger sums of money, then we recommend that they open a bank account. Yeah. And so there's different ways they can do it through mobile money. Uh, because one of the problems is that the banks are in the town, so they're very far away. Um, and it, the transport, it's, it's just difficult. So, so we help set up their local yeah, mobile banking mm. systems. Uh, yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah. such a good story. Um, so you're doing also a lot of other things. You you um, you help them with agriculture because they are all to to create perma gardens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both, so, both the yeah. refuge because you we also I, I I didn't mention because they are the uh, Ugandan people, but you, you also have you also dealing with a lot of refugees from some South Sudan That's that are correct. living in the areas. Yeah, yeah. So the women the women that we work with are living in extreme poverty. And so it's very hard to move beyond that. Yeah. And we believe that if you focus on a number of different actions, then those put together will move people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. so, so access to capital and the microfinance system, that's one part of a whole theory of change that we have. And so um, like you mentioned, agriculture is part of that as well, because that's really where um, the majority of people we work with are farmers. And yeah. so they will have their farming, and then they will also have all these different side businesses that they start together with um, the, the microfinance. And also they use the microfinancing to invest in their farming. 
So what we do is just help with, with techniques that will um, improve yields and, and make them more successful. Mm -hmm. um, and the perma garden that was specifically started to address issues of lean periods and malnutrition that um, many of the communities we work with, they're going through what they call hunger periods, mm -hmm. which is the time before the harvest when they run out of food um, and there's still you know, a month or two months before they're harvesting. And so people cut down on the food consumption to maybe one meal a day or one meal every other day. And obviously this is not sustainable. Yeah. So permagardens help with that. And then, like you mentioned, we're also working with South Sudanese refugees and they are completely dependent on food aid. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the permagardens are small gardens that use permaculture and biointensive methods to grow food. And so with these gardens, um, refugees are able to increase the number of meals that they have. They have a more nutritious diet. Some are able to actually sell some of the produce so that they get an income. And, um, and we've actually also started the same kind of microfinance programs within the refugee camps. And it's been very, very successful, especially if we combine it with, with permagardens. Yeah. Do, do they uh, mix the two groups, uh, uh, the Ugandan people and the uh, Sudanese people? Do they mix or, or they don't, um, are they two different um, groups? Because it, it, yeah, they, it, generally they're different because <laughs> they, um, they live in different areas. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's, uh, um, we, we, we try to do some work where we have refugees and uh, host communities working together. Like for example, um, one issue is access to land mm -hmm. and where some of the host communities are providing access to land for farming for the, the refugees. But that's, I mean, so far, that's just a, a couple hundred people that we do this with. Yeah. Okay. Mm, great. Mm -hmm. And then you have, because you have, you have five different uh, projects going, right? You have, uh, I would just say uh, adult literacy and you have uh, girls education also, and, and then the refugees. Um, so, so the adult literacy, you have 44, centers in U Uganda where you teach um, adults adults to read and write? Yes, so this, the, the number 44 was before the pandemic started. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, with our funding being reduced, we were, we had to make some very difficult decisions yeah. and um, we had to, to cut some programs and, and the adult literacy was one of that. Okay. So this year we have been able to start five centers. So it's still you know, a very, very important program. And I think that was one of the hardest decisions I made in a long time was to have to close those. Yeah. Uh, but, but the adult literacy centers are extremely important in our whole theory of change and the centers are so much more than just a place to learn how to yeah. read and write. It's really a very dynamic, um, a dynamic area where people can, can get together and look at what are the issues that they have in their communities and then come up with a solution to it. Mm -hmm. And to what we help facilitate is this understanding that you can do it on your own. You don't have to wait for someone else. You don't have to wait for the government to come and build that bridge. Mm -hmm. But if you come together as a community, you can do it yourself. And so we, we've seen communities um, build markets, clear roads. Mm -hmm. uh, they've learned about malaria and, and, and looked at what can we do in our community to ensure that, that our children don't get sick with malaria um build bridges so many amazing things have happened through these 
these centers. And um, to me, one of the most important things is um, we, one of the issues that the women identified, and there's not only women at these centers, but they identified as a problem, the fact that there are not enough leaders, community leaders that they can trust. And mm -hmm. so the solution to this was to run for public office. So in this last general election, which happened just in January this year, we had 57 participants who ran for office and 37 won. That's and to me, yeah, that <laughs> is empowerment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's yeah. how you change the world. Yeah. yeah, that is great. But I think, I think your, your theory uh, is the most, the, that it has to be themselves, the, the, the local people who does everything themselves. Would, so of course you are there as overall manager, but in the local communities, they do it all by themselves. They don't have a, a, an American or European or uh, someone from outside to, to tell them what to do. This is their, their, their initiatives, their, their work. They see the solution and they see the, the result for themselves. I think that's it's it's really powerful to do it this way, so they feel engaged. Yeah. In, in yeah. But, no, and, and I mean, I I will always be an outsider. I yeah, mean, I've been yeah. in Uganda since two thousand and six, but I'm still, and I I of course feel part of the culture and 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 the country, and I love being there, but I'm never truly going to understand the situation that yeah. these refugees are in or that these women in our communities are in. Yeah. Um, and they are very capable and they understand and know what they need. So there, it's not my place to, to say so. Yeah. Um, and, and also with our staff, you know, most of our staff come from the communities where they are working. And so the staff also mm -hmm. They understand these problems because yeah. we're they're yeah. working with their aunties and grandmothers, yeah. and um, and something that has been very important to me too is this is a women's empowerment organization, and we have women in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. So six out of our seven managers and directors in Uganda are women. Super. Um, yeah, that's great. That is really, really good. I'm very happy for you. Um, it's, uh, you also, that's something we can talk about a little bit later because I wanted to talk about uh, girls' education. Or, or, yeah, but uh, of course, we are all very concerned right now about the COVID situation. And, and uh, I imagine also in Uganda, I just, though, um, I've heard in an interview with you that, that Uganda closed its borders very quickly um, to, yeah. to avoid uh, the pandem pandemic to, to, um, to spread. So they actually uh, have done pretty good in, in Uganda, right? That's, that's correct. Yeah. And um, they closed the border very quickly. And Uganda has you know, decades of experience with Ebola mm -hmm. and how yeah. to handle health crisis like that. Yeah. So I think there was an understanding right away that if this comes to the country, we don't have the capacity. Um, our health services cannot handle this. So the response was to close down. Yeah, and that's good. But yeah, you also write some place that um, the, the, well, the big problems with the, with the COVID is that it's, um, it has increased the numbers of um, very young girls getting married also young girls getting pregnant and, and um, domestic violence. And how, how can you as an organization help that? Can you, yeah, what can you do on, on these? Yeah, so, so, so the reason for increase in, in underage marriages and um, teen pregnancies is because when the country was shut down, everything within the country was also shut down. So local yeah. markets, yeah. Um, trade, transport. So people were losing income and, um, and hunger became a, a real issue. So for some of these families, 
if they have a young daughter, um, if they marry her off, that means she's going to another family that can feed her and yeah. they don't have the responsibility for that anymore. So, so it, you know, it's a very, very difficult situation that families are in. Um, what we have done as an organization is um, we, we run a girls education program uh, where we are working with um, schools in local communities in Northern Uganda and also two schools in, in one of the refugee camps for South Sudanese refugees. And uh, obviously like it, in the rest of the world during this time, schools were closed down um, and we have a systems of mentors that work mm -hmm. in the schools with the students. And our mentors continued to work with the, with the students by doing home visits and providing mm -hmm scholastic materials that they could work on. And so when, so our mentors would also connect with parents and you know, identify problems if there were any. And so within our cohort of girls, we were able to, to make sure that you know, there were no early marriages mm -hmm. and also, um, I think there was maybe one or two girls that became pregnant, but we were able to to really keep that down as well. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Hi, uh, because that's also a question I have for you, the mentors, because they play a huge role uh, in your organization. How how do you select them? Where, what um, what profile do they have? And and how yeah how do you select them? So um, we we hire from within the local community. Okay, and. Um, so we will put out an announcement via radio and um, we'll, you know, put up something in the community centers and then you know, hire people. And we, for the mentors that work with students and, and have an academic focus, we obviously, they need to have a certain level of education, at least high school. Yeah. Um, but then we also look at, you know, we, we prefer to hire women if we can. Uh, we look at their, um, the way they interact with people, the personality, um, you know, working with, with girls, it's not, uh, we want to have young people that can be role models yeah. for these girls. Yeah. And they are, are they are young ones also, the, the one, the, the mentors, are they pretty young or, or do you use? take them a little older um generally <laughs> they are young but sometimes um like for example if we can find um teachers that are not working you know mm -hmm. we are happy to bring them on mm -hmm. as mentors mm -hmm. yeah. and they are all <clears throat> sorry they're all employed by you no 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 volunteers they all they all um sorry <clears throat> they're all employed it's, it's staff yes, it's working staff yeah it's, it's all working stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Super. Um, oh, I have so many questions. <laughs> uh, but at the time, we also have to, to wrap up a little bit. Um, yeah. How do you see the, how do you see the future for, for Uganda and for your organization? You have hope for them? I'm, I'm very hopeful. Um, I, um, Looking at our work and and the work that is being done by our staff in Uganda, mm -hmm. um, we're seeing amazing change. Yeah. I uh, so I was in Uganda in February, and uh, I was visiting. I was trying to visit as many of our groups of women as possible. I spent first time with staff, and we we're going over budgets and all those kinds of things. And um, then I was out in the communities and there's one woman who was saying that even though they've been going through all of these difficult times during um, the COVID time, they were still doing far better than many of their neighbors and that they had been able to buy metal sheets mm. for their houses. Many, you know, most of the women they live in in huts that have thatched grass roof. And 
it's a problem because you know they cook inside and it very easily will caught on fire and then people lose everything they own. So so getting a metal roof <laughs> that's a big investment. And she was saying that this year because of the microfinancing every single member in their group, or 30 of them, had afforded to buy these metal roofs. And, and so this woman was saying, you know, when visitors come, they don't even recognize our village anymore. <laughs> uh, um, oh, it's beautiful. Is it a, a malaria area where you are? Yes, it is. Yeah, high, yeah. high risk malaria. Do, do you provide yeah. them with the mosquito nets or? Or no, just... so we we don't provide anything like that. Okay, but we so so the whole idea is with the microfinance, you now have the ability to buy it on your own. Yeah, right. So so what we will do, for example, very often in the at the adult literacy centers, we will invite people to come and talk about malaria. And you know, what can they do within their community to prevent malaria? Uh, is there standing water in the compound? Um, you know, things like that. And, um, and then if people want to buy nets, but they don't have access to it, we mm -hmm. can help them with that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the centers, do you also make uh, awareness programs against uh, sexual violence? Um... Uh, safe birth, uh, you know, women's women's problems. Do do you have someone who comes in and talk to them about the different different subjects? Yes, we do. So so the subjects that are chosen is is the decision of the groups themselves. Yeah. So so we can't you know, we help guide it, um, but it's at the end it's the the women themselves who identify them, yeah. but. Of course, you know, issues of domestic violence, of, um, you know, all the, those things that you were talking about often come up. Yeah. And actually one of the benefits that we've seen from our programs is a reduction in domestic violence. Because yeah. as household has more access to money, you know, it's easier to resolve problems. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, that's something I experienced myself. When when the women start to make money, they suddenly they have a voice in the house. They have a they have they have a place. They have a yeah. They have a voice. They have a, they have respect. They get respect often uh, for, from their husbands. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, we're seeing that, and and something that many women talk about is that now when they have their own money, they don't have to ask their husbands for yeah. for money. Yeah. And that makes for a more smooth relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have one, one experience? I know you probably have had a lot, a lot of fantastic experiences. Do you have one that stands out from all the other ones? You know, something you say, this is, I, this is the reason why I do this or, uh, uh, yeah, you know. Uh, yes, there, there are. Yeah, there, there are many moments like that, but one um, that I'm thinking of specifically now is, um, so, so we run this girls education program and every time that I go to visit women's groups, I talk about the importance of keeping girls in school. Yeah. And in many of these communities, not a single girl completes primary school. Um, and very few continued to secondary. So we, so we have a, a conversation where I ask, you know, what, what do you think the problem is and how can we resolve this? And what we eventually get down to is that it's an issue of, of poverty, that all of these parents, they want their children to succeed in school, but because of poverty, they're you know, they have to ask the girls to help with fetching water or mm -hmm. collecting firewood. Or if uh, you know another child is sick, the girl has to stay home from school to take care of, you know, mm -hmm. there are all these issues that keep them from going to school. And so the parents think, you know, oh, you know, she's just home one day and then she'll go yeah. back. But, but she keeps missing school days. 
so I, and I'm making this way too long here, but so I'm trying to shorten it. <laughs> <Yeah. fine. laughs> so, um, so I'm telling this story and uh, or we, we're having this discussion. And at the end of it, there's this woman who comes up to me and she says, you know, this is what you were talking about is exactly what happened to me. And um, I kept missing days at school. And then my parents said, I'm stupid. Why should they send me to school at all? And I have two daughters and I'm going to make sure that they go to school every single day. And that was... It was such a profound yeah. moment yeah. for me, yeah. you know, to to hear that from her. That you know, she's she's really she's going to make a difference for her girls. Yeah, that is amazing. And I think when you when you visit your website and, and you reach all, uh, read all the testimonials from from the from the women. It's amazing uh, how much it changes their lives. I think we cannot, in a civilized world, we cannot uh, measure the the difference of what an education can make a dif- how an, an education can make really a difference in in a country like that. So um, um, for us, it's so so normal to go to school. We all do it, but yeah. these these girls they 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 need it, and and they are the way f- forward. So and. Um, what would you say would be your biggest challenge in all this, in, 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 in doing um, this organization? Um, I think uh, the, the biggest challenge right now is access to funding. Okay, yeah. That we, we could do, we have the capacity to do so much more. My staff wants to do more. Mm-hmm. And what's holding us back is lack of resources so and and with the covid year we were not able to do the events that we usually do i was not able to interact with donors um so so right now that that is the biggest challenge for us yeah i hope it will soon be over so you can restart i your hope so too <laughs> so i think we all <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Linda, may I ask you what what does it cost to to run an organization like uh, like yours? How much money do you need to to re- to to recall every every year to make it function? Really, so, on so the we, highest we level. Have, yeah, we have a budget that is around a million dollars right now. Okay. And our goal is to get it up twice the size. Yeah. Okay. And and obviously with that we will be able to increase to reach more people. Yeah, so that's the goal to continue yeah. your your is it five programs projects you have and and then just uh, increase the pe- number of people you you can reach. Yeah, and and what we also what we really want to focus on is not just increasing the number of people that we work with, but to help other local organizations. Okay. To to give them skills that they can use then in their communities. Yeah. So that that's a way that we can reach even more people yeah how many people would you say that you're reaching now so we right now if you include the the refugees that we're working with it's about twenty thousand people mm. so that's twenty thousand that we work with directly and then with the dependents the children that they have that's yeah. about 150,000 people <laughs> it's quite a lot of people yeah yeah <laughs> oh it's fantastic um just uh, yeah. Do you think there's something we haven't discussed, or you you want to say a word? Uh, I, I think you. I think you covered it very yeah. well. You had some okay. very good questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So so I have one last question for you. Actually, you do uh, an amazing lot of good things for other people. What can we do for you? Oh. Um... Um, what can you do for me? Well, I mean, have, what you're doing right now is exactly what, what the organization needs. You know, someone who highlights what we're doing, mm-hmm. um, that, that to me is amazing. Okay. And I really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. <laughs> and I can, um, 
Yeah, I just want to say thank you to you. It's uh, you, you're really doing an amazing job, and I, and I I invite everybody to go to your website and and take a really good look at what you're doing. Um, it's not just a, and if, by the way, your photos are amazing. I know it's a, it's a it's an Australian photographer who takes the photos. He he's actually uh, he's American, oh, but sorry. he lives in Australia. <laughs> okay. He lives yeah. in Australia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also, just for that, the, the it, it's worth visiting your your website. They, they are they are really amazing and um, just get into the heart of what what it's all about. But uh, thank you so much, Linda, for taking the time. I I wish you all the best for for you and your organization, and uh, we will do everything we can. Uh, in Women for Humanity to, to spread the word and, um, and hopefully um, start helping you, you recall some funds to, to collect some funds so you can, can continue the, your, your good job and, and, and everything you're doing. So thank you very much for thank your time. Thank you, Lisbeth. It's, yeah. it's been an honor to be included with all of the amazing women on <laughs> your you. site here. So oh, okay. the That's honor is all nice. mine. Oh, thank you yeah. so much. I send you a big kiss and thank you for your time. So thank you. I will close the, the video, but we can just have a little chat afterwards. <laughs> thank you. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah.